You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Welcome to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode comes from Eric Hoffer and says, In times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. It's a pretty deep quote, right? And in this episode, we're certainly going into the deep end of what it takes to win the day. Our guest is Simon T. Bailey, who is a Hall of Fame keynote speaker, author of 10 books, and is in high demand from some of the world's most recognized companies to help them transform their customer experience. But you probably know Simon from the Goldcast video that went viral in 2018 and has since amassed almost 100 million views. Here's an excerpt from that video. Because I was so busy trying to make so much money that my ladder was against the wrong wall. And their mother said to me, you give everybody the best of you, but you give us the rest of you and I don't want the leftovers anymore. And what I recognized, I was modeling something for Daniel and Madison that you gotta go after, you gotta get all this stuff. And I had the house, but I lost the home. I had success, but I had no significance. I had power, but I had no purpose. And I had money, but I had no meaning. And what I discovered, if I continue to model that behavior for my baby girl, that she would marry a joker like me who ignored her like her dad did. So what I recognize is that I had to move from hearing Madison to listening to Madison. Because the same letters that spell the word listen spell the word silent. And when I have that time with my baby girl, I'm dialing in, how are you? And I'm modeling something for her brother as to how he's supposed to treat a woman. Women don't need us to fix anything. They just want to know, are we emotionally available and emotionally dialed in to know where they are? When it is time for you to make a U-turn and shift into your brilliance, we will have to come to a place where we're willing to do the work. It's not who you are that holds you back from brilliant success, it's who you think you're not that holds you back. And sometimes we focus on who we think we're not instead of who we are. So now, now I, I, through pain, I'm learning that relationships are more important than money. You can check out a link to the full Goldcast video in the show notes. Simon's Spark framework is based on more than 30 years experience in the hospitality industry, which included working as sales director for the Disney Institute, based at the Walt Disney World Resort. He was recently awarded a doctorate of science in business administration for his global impact. Simon's purpose is to disrupt people's mental habits so they can lead countries, companies, and communities differently. And as I'm sure you'll notice, there's a level of authenticity, positivity, and calm that helps Simon instantly resonate. In this interview, we'll go through how to find your purpose in an instant, what business owners can do to deliver an amazing customer experience every time, the biggest mistakes aspiring keynote speakers make, the number one decision that led to Simon's prolonged success, and how to identify and leverage the power of relationships to supercharge your life. Before we begin, remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one who needs to hear this episode, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with Simon T. Bailey. Simon, great to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on the Win the Day show. Good to see you as well. Thank you for having me. Well, also a big shout out to Dave Wilderson and the team at Sam Wisdom Book Publishers for reconnecting us. I know in addition to an amazing energy, there's going to be a lot of great insights from you today, Simon. I've been a big fan of your your work for many years and have witnessed it firsthand at the success event in Long Beach a few years ago. So I'm really excited for this interview. Can you take us right back to your teenage years? How was your experience at high school and what did uh, what did success look like to you growing up? I was a total failure. (laughs) I was in the bottom half of the class that made the top half of the class possible, if the truth be told. (laughs) My freshman year, I I failed all the classes, uh, sheet metal, plumbing, air conditioned, refrigeration. I went out for sports, got cut from the football team, 
cut from the basketball team, went out for track and field. They said, you're too slow. Maybe try cross country. <laughs> so if I was in Texas right now, even though I live in Florida, they would say, bless my little heart. <laughs> And I ended up moving to another school. Uh, my parents decided I needed a fresh start. And that's where I met my English teacher, Ms. Rita Lankus. And she said to me, young man, I want you to write a speech and give it before the entire school. And that changed the trajectory of my life. Yeah. So that was, that was the foundations of the speaking career, was it, right then and there? Totally. Yeah, so much of that, it just takes one person to believe in you or just to help point you in the in the right direction. And we put so much pressure on kids at such a young age these days to figure out what they want to do for the rest of their lives. When there's a very good chance, like it sounds like for you, it certainly was for me, when they don't even know who they are at that point. How did your personal experiences in high school shape the way that you parented your own children through that phase? Well, I'll be the first one to say I was guilty of that. I've been saying to my children, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I recently had to apologize to them and say, that's the wrong question. In a world of artificial intelligence, automation, uh, and Alexa, the question is, what problem have you been created to solve? So I apologize to them. And I think for me, it started with um, how... So I said Alexa's name. Alexa, stop. (laughs) I'll start over. Um, I had to apologize to my children because I was doing that very thing to them. And I think for me, what happened in high school, once I found my swim lane, number one, it built my confidence. Number two, it gave me the ability to wake up every single day to say, this is something that I'm really good at. And then number three, I stopped comparing myself to everyone else. And that has really informed who I've become as an adult. You know, that that thing that you mentioned there about what problem are you created to solve, that's so good because something I still catch myself doing I have, I think I've lost count now. What have I got? 12 nephews and nieces. So I'm around a lot of young children. They're they're all in Australia. So unfortunately, I don't get to go back as much as I would like to during the pandemic. But it's something that I still catch myself saying is, what do you want to be when you grow up? But I've never had a good alternative because just instinctively, we want to to say that. So I think mentioning that is really, really important. So uh, I love that, Simon. Thank you for sharing that. And the the shift that you have had from that uncertainty and that adversity that you experienced growing up into the man you are today, named a Hall of Fame keynote speaker, recognized as one of the top life and business strategies around and consultant to some of the most recognized brands on the planet. Can you take us into that moment when for the first time you truly felt like you could do anything that you set your mind to, that for the first time you actually had so much more power than you had ever ever given yourself credit for? I think when I finally stopped feeling sorry for myself about following the traditional path of finishing college in four years, it took me 10 years. And once I realized I didn't have to do it the way everyone else had done it or the way everyone else said it should be done, I woke up and said, light bulb moment, that's it. (laughs) So when everybody zigs, I should zag. And conformity robs you of creativity. So it's recognizing I had that power when I had the epiphany to say, I'm good, I'm okay. (laughs) That that conformity, I I was talking about like what problem are you created to solve? And then we talk about those polar opposites of conformity and creativity there. How much of an attribute is having a creative mind, even if you maybe are not doing the right things as far as your teachers are concerned, or maybe even as far as your parents are concerned, but staying true to that creative nature that you had? Is that a really valuable skill for people to, to move forward with in the world that we're in? Yes. In fact, LinkedIn says the number one skill that's required by entrepreneurs, individuals over the next few years, number one uh, is creativity. Uh, Number two, adaptability. Number three, collaboration. But that creative ability gives you the choice to figure it out, to say, how can I see what others don't see? And it taps into your imagination, that invisible world where you begin to ask questions and become curious. And the moment you say, how can we? What if? It opens up a whole uh, array of options to you. 
Yeah, love it. That's so good. And you served as sales director for the Disney Institute based at the Walt Disney World Resort. What magic did you learn being part of the, the renowned Walt Disney family? I learned uh, three things. Number one, it's all about plussing up the experience. So plussing up the experience, uh, as you know, is that when the animators are are creating things, they look for that little something extra. That's phenomenal. Second thing I learned is hire for attitude, train for success. Training doesn't fix what an entrepreneur, a leader, or a business owner doesn't catch, right? So Disney takes twice as long to hire someone because they realize that families have saved thousands of dollars to maybe come to Disney for once in their lifetime. So they got to get it right. And then probably the third thing that I learned is never, ever settle for anything that's less than excellent. If, if you can't do it right and you won't spend the money, don't do it at all. Because if you try to cut a corner here, cut a corner there, it ends up catching up with you. Make the investment on the front end. It'll pay off in the long run. Yeah, it reminds me of that mantra, everything is everything, which I, I'm sure you've probably heard about as well. Yes. It's, it's so powerful. Uh, and your spark formula is really interesting. I know you mentioned or you alluded to some of the elements there in, in what you just provided. And that spark formula is what you created after spending more than 30 years in hospitality and customer experience. When it comes to the customer experience today, what are the biggest mistakes that you see business owners make? So I'll give you an example. I took my car to be serviced at an auto dealership. And when I completed the service appointment, the gentleman says to me, hey, you're going to get a link with a survey. If you can't give me a five, don't fill it out. Call me back and let me know. And I was like, dude, dude, that's not the behavior that they want you to have. <laughs> You might, you might go out of business, but they're going to have all five stars on them. <laughs> but think about it. The five stars was tied to him probably getting a bonus, getting his paycheck. And if it wasn't a five, his boss would have a meeting with him. That's wrong. That's not the behavior or mindset you want. Oh, it's, it's so true. And what about, what about business owners out there who say, look, I just don't have the, the money or the resources to be able to focus so much on that customer experience? Is, is having an amazing customer experience almost a prerequisite for anyone who wants to be in business in 2021 and beyond? Absolutely. Every business owner has to begin to embed the chip of what great service looks like, because if you don't, you pay for it in the end. Here's why. You become very transactional in dealing with customers, and customers can easily sense that they are seen as a dollar sign, not a long-term relationship. Because when it's a long-term relationship, you're looking for opportunities to exceed their expectation and make sure that they come back and that they yelp about your brand. The second thing is everyone that works with you realizing realizes you have a don't care attitude, just give them whatever. And that's the attitude that they are going to have because it's not important to you, it's not important to them. And then sadly, customers begin to tell their friends about the experience that they did or did not receive from your brand. Yeah, and it's much easier to spend that time on retaining an existing customer rather than go and find a new one, right? Yes, that's what all the research says. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you mentioned a bad example before, a bad experience that you had. Aside from Disney, what other companies out there do you see who are doing it really well from the customer experience side? I think uh, T-Mobile does it right. I learned from T-Mobile, uh, a customer service is a department, but customer love is a mindset. And that customer love mindset looks for a way to say, how do I uh, own the customer experience? If I hear it, I own it. And I solve their problem quicker and faster and do it with a smile. I think the other thing that I learned from T-Mobile is finding a way to say yes instead of no. Because when you find a way to say yes and go above and beyond, that customer is forever grateful. How do, how do you go about injecting the human as early as possible with balancing profitability? I mean, there are some companies out there who I probably shouldn't even mention. It just drives me completely bonkers when all I want to, I know a human can resolve this in five seconds, but sometimes the voice, the, the automated voice, the machine can't even figure out exactly like to point you in the, in the right place. You spend 45 minutes waiting on when it might be something through no fault of your own. You might've been billed incorrectly by the company. Obviously the companies need to be profitable 
How do they balance that profitability with providing a great customer experience? They've got to listen to the voice of the customer and then actually do something about it. It's not as if customers don't give feedback digitally and online. Some companies just don't care and they don't do anything about it. So they kind of do the window dressing of, hey, we're concerned about customer satisfaction. That's a smokescreen. Underneath it all, they don't do anything about it. And then eventually it catches up with them because you realize online reviews are kind of like on there forever, right? And then people really see that, you know what? They tell us they believe in great customer service, but they don't live it. And customers will see that disconnect and start doing business with that business. Yeah, there was one There was one cable company. Again, I, I won't mention them, but they had billed me incorrectly for so many periods of time and it was so frustrating to even get someone on the phone when what they say eventually is, you know what, we're going to give you 500 channels. And then after three months, if you don't want it, you've just got to give us a call and we'll get them off. I'm like, it is impossible to get any human on the phone at your company. I don't want your crappy channels anyway, because I barely watch TV. And it's like, that is not the great solution to go and do that. And then when you go and see a commercial for that company where it's like, we just got voted best in customer experience, that is what drives me to say, you know what, now is about time. I want to get on, on Twitter or something like that to go and share the experience that you've had with some of these companies because yeah. they, they feel like they can pull the wool over your eyes a little bit as far as um, them not delivering, but then also trying to flaunt their, uh, their awards and things like mm -hmm. that. It's just not great in this digital world that we're in. Mm -hmm, totally. And I believe companies who are really committed and businesses that are really committed, they are the ones who will win in the end. Yeah, and I bet they're led by great people. I'm sure a lot of people that you have worked with personally who are leading these great businesses. There's people like Keith Ferrazzi, who we've had on the show before, who's the number one New York Times bestselling author of books like Never Eat Alone. The people there who can inject that human experience and make sure that the customer is always is always kept front of mind. It's so valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you had to narrow down, uh, if you had to really narrow in on the Simon T. Bailey brilliance, what one or two attributes would you say have made you so successful and, and contributed to that prolonged success? that you enjoy today? I think, uh, first of all, I really care about people. I really care about those that I serve. And it's just not lip service. Uh, I think the second thing is I still operate with that Disney mindset and it's looking for an opportunity to create a magic moment, uh, whatever that might be for the customer. So it's in delivering consistency and it's in delivering consistency. And I know that's not deep and that's not, you know, some big aha, but it's delivering consistency every single day, not because I have to, but because I want to. And in our team, that's just how we roll. That's what we do. Yeah, I guess that builds trust. So it means that if anyone knows that they're going to, they're looking for someone else and you have an opportunity to fill that, they're going to say, Simon, Simon's team are a perfect fit to come on board without you having to do anything. You've got a whole bunch of frontline brand advocates out there to start driving business your way. Is that right? Totally. Yeah, I love that. So good. And as we mentioned earlier, you're an incredibly skilled speaker. People see the end result, but they don't see the reps behind the scenes. They don't see the years it takes of mastery of that craft to get to being able to seamlessly deliver a presentation in front of tens and thousands of people. How did you turn yourself into a masterful speaker? And how has that skill aided your career? I think uh, one day I woke up and I decided to be myself. I realized that I had listened to Zig and Jim Rohn and Mark Victor Hansen and Les Brown and all of the greats. And there was a piece of them in me, but you never got to me. So one day I had the epiphany and I said, you know what? I'm just going to be me. I'm going to be my authentic self and I'm going to show up and tell my story and, and, and be in that moment. And that's when everything totally shifted. Uh, when I realized uh, John Mason, who wrote the book, An Enemy Called Average, says most people are born originals, but they die copies. And I was tired of being a copy. Or as I said at the National Speakers Association uh, almost uh, whew, 15 years ago, when I was blessed with the opportunity to be the open keynote speaker, I said, there comes a time when you no longer want to be an annoying echo, but you want to be an original voice. And, and that was my wake-up call to really begin to understand how to be my authentic self. 
You know, I want to I want to acknowledge you for a moment because the way that you carry yourself on stage, not just for one session, not just for one day, for multiple days, you have that amazing charisma, but it's almost it's so valuable from a business, from an actual takeaway perspective, yet it's so relaxed. It's so it's so effortless the way that you do that. And I think that really does only come from you really dialing into your authentic self and saying, look, I'm not going to be a copy like those people that you mentioned there. So that's a really, really great, uh, a really great lesson. And I think it's something for people, not just on stage, but something they can attribute to all of other, all of the other areas of their life. Uh, what is your process to get in your optimal state before you walk out on stage? I think uh, remembering what my therapist told me a few years ago as I was on this journey and, and her, her advice to me was whatever you don't deal with will eventually deal with you and will show up on stage. And I was like, hmm. So a part of my process is to always go within and say, how do I serve? How do I connect? And how do I leave it all on the stage? So literally, that's the process that I'm going through in my mind. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been to Italy before and gone to the Sistine Chapel. Mm -hmm. But when you walk into the Sistine Chapel and you see what Michelangelo did, you're kind of like, how in the world did someone do this? And the reason I share this with you is because after I saw the Sistine Chapel, I just said a little prayer. And I said, God, before I go on this stage, would you simply speak through me like you painted the Sistine Chapel through Michelangelo? That's my prayer. And I just release it. And every place we go, I, I'm never disappointed because it's, it's not me. It's the light, life, and love of God that comes through me. Yeah, and I, I bet that removes any element of ego that you have as a result of that. Is that right? Totally. Yeah. It's so not about me. <laughs> People out there, they're busy like, how do I get in this state to be the hero, to go and do all this stuff? But you're not that hero. As you said, the opportunity to serve, to connect, to give people these yeah. valuable takeaways that they can go and find their, uh, themselves. And I bet that probably removes a little bit of the, the nervous side too. Like, so you're not out there thinking about, oh, what, what happens, what happens if, but if I'm out there merely as a, almost like a conduit to help serve and help people help themselves, then it's going to be a much better outcome and you can step into a better better energy. Totally. I've had opportunities when the PowerPoint didn't work or the mic was cut and I had a countryman and I had to switch to a handheld. And what I realized in that moment, you know what, here I am. This is real time. I'm perfectly imperfect. I'm flawed. I've made more mistakes than I can count on both hands. And when I decided to come alongside the audience from that standpoint, it made me more human and more relatable because I wasn't trying to stand up and be so perfect and realize things will happen. And how do you show up in the moment, in that human moment and still be real with individuals? Yeah, it's the opportunity for them to see you with that courage under fire, where if all of a sudden, if you've got flustered and you're angry, then people are like, oh, wow, Simon doesn't talk about brilliant living. He doesn't practice it. He might talk about it, but he doesn't actually live it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, being a leader on stage is about the best thing that you can do, I believe, to build your influence at scale. What are the biggest mistakes you see amateur speakers make who want to get to that next level? I think, uh, number one, trying to tell the audience everything you know. Uh, if it's Googleable, they don't need to hear it from you, but what's your insight into what information you are presenting. I think the, the second thing is trying to do all that those who have gone before you said, you got to do this and you got to do that. And what happens is you end up being a floor lamp of diffused energy that's pulled in a million different directions. You never become laser focused. And I, I made that mistake. So I'm not saying anything out of school here. But then I think the third thing that amateur speakers make is they feel that they have to say yes to everything in order to get established. And I believe there are some things that you should maybe turn down and pass on to others who are truly that subject matter expert. And because of the law of reciprocity, what goes around comes around, you give it away and another door will open for you to walk through that was meant for you. I can't tell you how many times we have just turned things down. I said, that's not my fit. That's not what I do, but let me refer you to someone and totally being okay and letting that go. 
Yeah, I'm a huge believer in that too. And uh, I bet that speaks to the integrity then where people know you're not just going to put your hand up for everything. They say that, look, if Simon is going to do this, he's the real deal. He's going to get out here and kick ass and, and give an amazing presentation. Well, you've, you've spent decades shifting people into their brilliance. How can someone find their purpose and how important is that purpose in long-term success and happiness? Finding your purpose is starting with what's right in front of you. So many times people think they have to do something really big outside of themselves. And it could simply mean walking outside your door and asking your neighbor, how can I serve you? What is it that you need? That's where your purpose starts. Uh, I think purpose is so critically important because purpose gives you hope that wakes you up to live better tomorrow than you did yesterday, right? So I think everyone has to really begin to think about, am I living on purpose? Have I tapped into my universal assignment? And if I had, if I have it, why not? And, and that's where people have to start, because the moment you find a, pur a purpose, you are never late. You're always early. When you find your purpose, everyone that comes into your quantum field, they know that you're in the zone. When you find your purpose, it's not about what you can get in the form of money, but it's about what you can give. Uh, when you find your purpose, you tap into kindness, love, and goodness. Because any person that is truly living their purpose, they realize that I can eradicate evilness and hatred on the planet by coming from a place of love, because love starts with you. And when you're in your purpose, you have found your deeper love and people can feel it and connect with it and sense it every time you open your mouth or whatever you're doing. A big part of my work is moving people away from wanting to be a spectator in life into being more of a participant in life. Do you feel in your work and your experience that the thing that holds people back from really wanting to serve others and find that purpose and lean in more to that is because they're so caught up figuring out, look, if I can't change the world, that almost seems like such an insurmountable target. But that little task that you mentioned there of being able to walk outside your door and whether it's your neighbor or a friend or someone else in your network, just being proactive about asking how you can serve them, that's a really great way that they can start to participate. Is that your experience? Absolutely. It's taking that bold action to say, I start with myself, I ask my neighbor, then together we impact the community. The community impacts the city, the city impacts the state, the state impacts the nation. But so many want to change the nation and they haven't started with themselves. But if I start with myself, we may change the nation. I believe that that bold action every single day, consistently in a straight line, one direction saying, here's what I'm going to do today. Bold action every single day. That's why you're on the Win the Day show, Simon. I, I love it, my friend. Well, one of your quotes, which I love, is brilliance is a decision. Brilliance is a decision. What is your process to get someone out of a victim mindset, out of an I can't mindset, and into more of a growth mindset? You and I are both fans of Dr. Carol Dweck and, and her work. How can we shift people to actually be accountable, to empower themselves, to take ownership of their circumstances so they can not only unlock their potential, but they can also sustain it for a long period of time? I think everyone listening to us right now should go and get a sheet of paper and imagine that a story is about to be written about you because your picture is going to be on the cover of Time magazine as one of the top 100 most inspirational people in the world. What would you say in this interview? And I want you to write out all the questions, all the answers. If you have photos, incorporate that into this story of you. The moment you do that, what you're actually doing is you are reframing whatever you've been through to get a snapshot of what you're going to. Because the moment you begin to focus on what you're going to, you stop worrying about what you're going through. So every person listening to us right now, you rewrite and reframe the story as if, as James Allen talked about hundreds of years ago, as if it's already happening because this life is not a do-over. This is not a dress rehearsal. You can't get back the last year. It's gone. However, it's informed who you are becoming. And I believe when you come for this mindset, you literally live on fire 
every single day to say, I can't wait to attack the day. Powerful stuff, Simon. I love it. I love it so much. Uh, Out of all the people that you've worked with, and you've worked with probably hundreds of thousands of people now all around the world to help them move into a life that they just feel more comfortable with and they're more authentic with, is there a particular transformation that you're most proud of or that stands out to you from all the people that you've worked with? Oh, my goodness. I have had almost a dozen people who have reached out to me over the last few years to say that they have increased their income uh, to six figures. Uh, Many have increased their income to seven or eight figures uh, because of something they read, saw, uh, some coaching that we did. And I've just been humbled by that because when I started this journey and left Disney, I wasn't sure this was going to work. I believed that it was going to work, but I didn't know these people would show up with these results. And I think what's even more powerful, many of them have understood the power of a good mitzvah, the ability to give a deed, to to help someone else, to give a hand up and not just a hand out. And that just absolutely blesses my heart because I think that is so important to reach back and pull somebody forward. Yeah, every time in life we go through a dark period or something where we just feel like we can't, we're we're trapped, we can't figure out a way out, having someone's hand to reach in just to be there or just help us move even just one point forward to help get us to, to where we need to be is is so impactful. Um, and that's why the power of relationships, I think, has obviously been instrumental for you and I. And I'm, I'm super excited to talk yes. about relationships shortly uh, as the almost the secret weapons that have been able to help us continue to, to level up. Uh, before that, I want to talk about a few years ago. So a video of you on Goldcast absolutely blew up. And, and I think everyone who's on social media, which I guess is everyone in the world, saw this video. And in it, you you spoke about the relationship with your family and how the wrong focus almost cost you everything. How did it feel to see that video just with such a powerful message just spread like wildfire? It's humbling because it was totally organic. No boosting, no strategic meeting to say, guess what? We're going to make this go viral. (laughs) And, And so it's humbling because when you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. And I have received uh, thousands of comments from men who say, I now understand what my wife was trying to tell me. Uh, And and guys who perhaps they're a little bit uh, further down the path uh, and they said, you know what? I wish I would have done something differently. I had a guy reach out to me, says, hey, I'm on the verge of divorce. I watched the video and we were trading uh, Instagram messages back and forth. And I said, make sure you get in counseling. Try to save your marriage. You don't have to go through what I went through. Uh, So it's been it's been very, very humbling because I didn't see it coming. But one of the things that even to this day, I double down on being a better dad first a business person second, because it makes no sense to stand on a stage to tell anyone anything and your house is jacked up. And and so I think it's so critically important every single day to continue to do the work. So I I just want to be a better dad. Uh, that's, That's my focus. Yeah, I, I, the more that you and I talk, it's that alignment of who you are and what's most important in your life. It seems to be such a, a powerful thing in, in all of those different elements in life. And a metaphor that you use in that video is that people put their ladder up against the wrong wall. They put their ladder up against the wrong wall. And in a world that's moving like this digital age, that's moving at such a frenetic pace. Mm-hmm. How can people figure out what wall they need to put their ladder up against? And how often should they check in to make sure their ladder is still up against the right wall? I think number one, it's starting with what are your priorities? What's most important to you? Quality time with family. Uh, I think secondly, being intentional every single day to check in, to ask, how are you doing? What's going on? What can I do? And need uh, schedule an appointment. And I know this sounds so crazy, but block your time to say, you know what? This is family time. That's it. Point in case, my daughter, who just finished her first year of college, started a job. And uh, we decided that, you know what, it's not time for you to get a car yet. So I'm going to take you to work. And I've had to fit it in my schedule between everything that I've got going on. But can I tell you, it's that ride to work that she and I get a chance to talk and catch up. And she's telling me about her world. That's what it's about right there. 
Yeah, so true. I've got a two-year-old daughter and uh, any moment that you get with them, I think phones are the biggest enemy. It's it's phones I feel like cannot be in the same room, but it's hard when we use that to to take photos of those moments. So having that time actively blocked out and being super present, it's so important. There's, there's a quote that I've seen you post that says, in times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. What does that quote mean to you? Yeah, well, first of all, let me give credit to Eric Hoffer, who is a noted philosopher. That is his original quote uh, that I share. What that simply means to me is that wherever we are right now, we have to continue to learn and unlearn and begin to ask ourselves, the learning that I had last year, I may want broadband results, but am I using dial-up methods when it comes to staying on the edge of where things are going? So I'm constantly like channeling, channeling, saying, okay, we got to move in this direction. And the team knows that I have probably an idea minute because of something that I learned or something that I'm interested in. And I'm like, okay, let's blow up what we're doing. And let's do this, because I think you understand, in the words of John Maxwell, how to fail forward by learning and trying something, not just sitting and waiting for it to come to you. Yeah, so true. Uh, on this show, Simon, we like to keep it pretty real from a, a mental health perspective, just particularly based on what's been happening in the world in the last year or two. In your experiences that you've had, you've obviously been able to do so much in your career, entrepreneur and the corporate world. Is there a particularly dark day that stands out for you where you really questioned who you were or what you were doing on this on this planet, if you're, if you're open to answering that question? Yeah, obviously, uh, when the pandemic happened, I lost six figures worth of business within seven days. And it becomes very real when you have two kids in college and you're paying alimony and it's kind of like, okay, rut row, what are we going to do here? And the phone's not ringing, leads were not coming. So for a moment, if the truth be told, I got bitter, but then I said, I got to live out what I teach and it's time to get better. So we decided uh, to host a series of virtual events free of charge called Spark Hope. And we had almost a thousand people show up over the course of just a few weeks. And we decided that we would give uh, to the World Central Kitchen and a number of nonprofits. We said, hey, here is the, the link, go and donate. So even in the midst of feeling like my business has just disappeared, I said, how do we lift others up? How do we expose others? How do we care and share? And the moment we did it, all of a sudden, something just happened inside of me to say, we're going to get through this because hope is a superpower. Yeah, a lot of the the experiences that you have gone through where you have been at your best, it seems like your energy source has been has been correct. And that's where the power of the environment and the people that you're around, like having an opportunity where people might not even remember now, but I remember it was it was moving so fast, the world where it's like, what is going on here? Cities were shut down overnight. No one had any idea what was going on, but making that decision to lead during a time of great uncertainty has obviously been very, very valuable to you. Uh, on your on your best day, when you're in your most optimal state, what is an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard that you could show yourself on your worst day? I am Simon T. Bailey. I am brilliant. I am loved. I am cared for. And every single day, in every way, I am brilliant. Bravo. <laughs> I love that one, my friend. And as we mentioned earlier, relationships have been the single biggest force multiplier to, for you and I to, to get to where we are today and all of the opportunities that we've attracted and continue to attract. What can people do to start identifying the right relationships to focus on and how can they leverage them for long-term mutually beneficial gain, which goes back to the difference between transformation and transaction that you mentioned earlier? I think if there's a relationship you really want to connect with, think about the value that you can bring to that relationship. Just don't show up with hat in hand saying, can you help me? I think coming from that place to say, how can I be in service to you? That's the first thing. The second thing is when you're looking to establish a relationship, do more than what is asked for. Uh, find a way to go that extra inch. I had someone who I've gotten to know over the last few years and uh, he has more money than he knows what to do with, but his birthday was coming up. And so we decided to make a donation to a charity that he supports. 
And, and we just did it. And a note was sent from the charity to him that we made this donation. We heard from him. He was elated. He reached out and said, what can I do for you? So it's always just looking, there's, there's always another way to build that relationship. And I think the third thing to consider is to go back to a relationship who is giving you feedback or advice and say, here's what I did. Here was the impact. And thank you. What can I do to return the favor? Yeah, really good stuff there. That relationship aspect cannot be understated. Like it's it's so important. I I believe that the right question can help get you any opportunity that you want and surrounding yes. yourself with the right people can just, yeah, make these amazing things happen over time. Uh, we had two questions now from the Win the Day community, Simon, before we move into the, the rocket round. Uh, we've got Danny in Sydney, Australia, who asked, what did you do with your children from a young age to build positive relationships, establish resilience and put them on the right path? I took my children as many times as I could on trips with me to expose them to the world. Uh, and so the kids have been to Hong Kong, they've been uh, to Singapore and just exposing them to what's possible. The second thing is uh, a couple of summers ago, I actually hired my kids to work for the company and they had to listen to podcasts, read books, read articles, watch videos that I had sent to them already curated and then write a report. It was my sneaky way of them hearing the best of the best from others instead of dad telling them. <laughs> it's, and, and I it's, paid them. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible how much of that actually sinks in. Even if they're at a time where they might not be open to receiving those messages, they're still going to remember those seeds that you planted in there a long time and that travel thing providing the the perspective, not just possibility, but also that perspective of everything else out there, that the world's a very, very big place and there's so many different cultures and, and people and things like that is really, really important. We had, a, we had another question from the Win the Day community. We had Will, who was in Brisbane, also in Australia. And if you're listening to this podcast or watching this on YouTube and you want to make sure that you can get some questions asked of the guests who come on the show, remember to join the Win the Day Facebook group. The Win the Day Facebook group, a link to that will be put in the show notes. Will asked, how do you make time for the special moments when you've got both work pressures and life pressures and you know you can't drop the ball on either of them? Yeah, I would say, well, first of all, I love Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney. I've been to all three places. Australia is one of my favorite places in the world. Great food in Melbourne, by the way. Great uh, food and coffee. <laughs> yes, best food and coffee probably in the world is in Melbourne. So good. <laughs> A lot of people don't know that. You got to go to Melbourne, Australia. So I, I would say for me, I have an app called the Day One Journal that I use. And in that app, I'm constantly tracking how am I doing? What am I going to accomplish that day? And I might write down a word or two, but it informs my state of thinking and it sets the tone for the day. Um, my, I just looked at my day one journal app and I have almost a thousand entries in it uh, because it's that habit of going to it and seeing where I was this time last year, the year before that allows me to say, Here's how we're getting better. But then the second thing, it also holds me accountable to say, you know what? You've been stuck in this rut of thinking and it's time to shift gears and think in a new way. So great. So great. Well, I hope that answers the questions for Danny and Will. And thank you for providing those questions. And of course, thank you to you, Simon, for answering those questions. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Well, let's now move into the win the day rocket round. 10 quick questions for some uh, fairly quick answers. You ready for this one? Go for it. Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Oh my goodness. A paycheck is given to people who show up, but opportunities are given to people who think and work beyond what they're paid to do. Mic drop. I feel like we could almost end the interview there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. Uh, number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Morning coffee, of course. <laughs> Especially if you're in Melbourne. <laughs> number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? Save 50% of every dollar that you make, put it away. And then as you get older, 60%, 70%. So live off of less, save more. Number four, what book do you gift the most? Oh my goodness. Uh, Bob Berg's The Go-Giver uh, is such a great, great read. Number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? 
I think the vulnerability of being born in the third poorest city uh, in the United States and realizing that when you change your uh, mental zip code, you're no longer tethered to a physical zip code. Number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? That it's not final, it's only feedback. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Mother Teresa. I would ask her what made her uh, do all of the great deeds that she did. How did she find a way to make it happen? Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? Um, I would say a great resource, obviously, is my, my Google Calendar, <laughs> believe it or not, but also Dashlane, which, uh, you know, nowadays you have so many passwords in so many different places that I could just go to Dashlane, there it is right there, and it allows me to access everything instead of doing the forgot password, waiting for the email. <laughs> <laughs> Two-factor authentication. Yeah, it's a nightmare, especially if you're traveling international and you can't receive yes. the text messages. It's yes. so frustrating, isn't it? Uh, number nine, I'm very excited to hear your answer to this question. What's one thing on your bucket list? Oh, my goodness. So Four Seasons has a private plane that will take you around the world in three weeks. And you literally see the four corners of the earth by private jet. <laughs> That sounds like a fun time. And of course, Take stay in the four you. seasons. <laughs> <laughs> Number 10, final question. What's one thing you do to win the day? Every single day, wake up and I take a deep breath and I say, I'm so glad that I have this day in front of me because somebody laid down last night and they didn't wake up this morning. So the ability to pay attention to your breathing and getting centered, that's how you win the day every day. Maybe a little bit emotional, that one at the end there. That's really, really great, uh, really, really great advice. And thank you so much for sharing everything that you've shared today. You are the real deal. I love the fact that you always keep it uh, You always keep it real. There's no sugarcoating the stuff of what it takes to actually be success in those daily habits and disciplines. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Simon, and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at Simon T. Bailey. Grab a copy of his many awesome books like this one on Amazon and visit his website, simontbailey.com. Again, all of that and more will be linked in the show notes. Simon, can't thank you enough again. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, my friend. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Simon T. Bailey. There are so many practical takeaways and hopefully you'll have no trouble living your purpose after everything Simon shared. If a friend or loved one needs some help to win the day, share this episode with them right now. And if you joined this episode, hit the subscribe or the follow button and leave a comment with your most valuable takeaway. Win the Day with James Whitaker is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you want to submit questions of your own to the guests who come on the show, join the Win the Day group on Facebook. You'll find a link to that in the show notes. That's all for this episode. Remember to get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always. Always.